Hello and welcome to Evening Reading and Prayer. It's Tuesday, July the 9th of 2024. This evening our prayer resources come from the Iona Abbey Worship Book. The world belongs to God, the earth, and all its people. How good it is, how wonderful, to live together in unity. Love and faith come together, justice and peace join hands. If Christ's disciples keep silent, the stones would shout aloud. Open our lips, O God, and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Let us pray. O God, for your love for us, warm and brooding, which has brought us to birth and open our eyes to the wonder and beauty of creation, we give you thanks. For your love for us, wild and freeing, which has awakened us to the energy of creation, to the sap that flows, the blood that pulses, the heart that sings, we give you thanks. For your love for us, compassionate and patient, which has carried us through our pain, wept beside us in our sin, and waited with us in our confusion, we give you thanks. For your love for us, strong and challenging, which has called us to risk for you, asked for the best in us, and shown us how to serve. We give you thanks. O oh God, we come to celebrate that your Holy Spirit is present deep within us and at the heart of all life. Forgive us when we forget your gift of love made known to us in Jesus, and draw us into your presence. Amen. Our scripture readings this evening are from the book of Esther, beginning in chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, and 12 to 15. Then Haman said to King Ahasuerus, There is a certain people scattered and separated among the peoples in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every other people, and they do not keep the king's laws so that it is not appropriate for the king to tolerate them. If it pleases the king, let a decree be issued for their destruction, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who have charge of the king's business so that they may put it into the king's treasuries. Then the king's secretaries were summoned on the 13th day of the first month, and an edict according to all that Haman commanded was written to the king's satraps and to the governors all over the provinces and to the officials of all the peoples, to every province in its own script and every people in its own language. It was written in the name of King Ahasuerus and sealed with the king's ring. Letters were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces, giving orders to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all Jews, young and old, children and women, in one day, the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. A copy of the document was issued, was to be issued as a decree in every province by proclamation, calling on all the peoples to be ready for that day. The couriers went quickly by order of the king, and the decree was issued in the citadel of Susa. The king and Haman sat down to drink, but the city of Susa was thrown into confusion. And moving to chapter 4, verses 1 to 3 and 10 to 17. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went through the city, wailing with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. In every province, whether the king's command and his decree came, wherever, pardon me, the king's command and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting and weeping and lamenting, and most of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. Then Esther spoke to Hathach, and gave him a message for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law, to be put to death. Only if the king holds out the golden scepter to someone may that person live. 
I myself have not been called in to come to the king for 30 days. When they told Mordecai what Esther had said, Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place that you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. Then Esther said in reply to Mordecai, Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa, and hold a fast on my behalf, and neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. I and my maids will also fast as you do. After that, I will go to the king, though is it against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our reading this evening comes uh, by way of Anna Carter Florence's book, A is for Alabaster. Uh, this is 52 reflections on the stories of scripture. And this evening we're sharing E is for Esther. Esther shows up only once in the Revised Common Lectionary, in year B, the 19th Sunday after Pentecost, proper 21. Perhaps that's commentary in itself. Maybe the opportunities for us to step up and lean into a great act of courage come around so seldom that we get only one or two over the span of a lifetime. Maybe those moments of courage turn out to make a difference for hundreds or even thousands of people. Maybe for that reason they're remembered as great acts of heroism, even if it's not what we intended. In which case, the issue seems to be, will we recognize a singular moment and seize it when it comes? Will we find the courage to step into a void with no guaranteed outcome? Or will we hesitate just long enough for the moment to pass by beyond recall? How do we live in such a way that courage is available to us when we need it? There are no formulas, as Esther's story so aptly illustrates. She never asked for heroism. She never asked to be born in an empire hostile to her Jewish faith. She never asked to lose her parents and be raised by her uncle Mordecai, no matter how kind and wise he was. She never asked to be selected as a replacement queen in a kingdom-wide search meant as a royal distraction after the former queen's courage ended up publicly embarrassing the king. And she never asked for Haman, the king's hell-bent on revenge advisor, to manipulate the monarch into signing an edict to destroy all the Jews in the empire, simply because his ego was threatened by one man who refused to bow to him. Esther's uncle Mordecai bowed to no one but the Lord of the universe. And Haman, who felt entitled to Mordecai's deference and subjugation, was enraged by it. So Haman conceived a plan that played into public xenophobia and nationalism. Because Mordecai dared to stand, all Jews would pay the price. They would all be annihilated. Esther never asked for that. And she certainly never asked to be trapped in the middle of an insane power struggle for male dominance in the court. A struggle that, because of one man's rage, quickly ramped up to full-blown genocide. From the confines of the harem, Esther felt deflated and defeated enough to go down into silence. What could one woman in her position possibly do to stop an imperial juggernaut? Why should she think they would ever listen to her? Mordecai suggested she reframe the issue. Do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. The issue is not whether we have enough power to confront injustice. 
It's whether we recognize that it's time to step up and try. Time to speak. Time to act. Time to use whatever we have at our disposal. Even if it's a set of royal robes and a tiara, or jeans and a t-shirt. Those could work. Esther recognized her moment when it came around. Even more amazing, she seized it. And because of that, we remember her as one of the greatest heroines of her time and ours. A woman who stepped out of obscurity and hiding, which is what her name means. Esther literally means, I am hiding. Into a blazing spotlight of uncertain outcomes. There were no guarantees that she would succeed. There were no guarantees that she would survive. There was simply the imperative of the moment and the truth and the hope that her voice would be heard. Maybe she was sent to the kingdom for such a time as that. Maybe she did have enough courage to take a deep breath and use what she had. Esther doesn't surface much in Christian lectionary cycles, but our Jewish sisters and brothers have the right idea. Read the whole book out loud and in worship. Do it every year, as the biblical text prescribes. Make it a festival called Purim to commemorate the story. Get the children involved with costumes and parades. Raise them with the expectation of the story, pardon me, that, that the story of Esther isn't optional or occasional. It's written into our life. It's written into our faith. And it will come up each year, and then again in each life. And we have all that we need to play it. Let us pray. For the roots of our community and of all our communities, we thank you, living God. For what we share together here and for the life we share with others, we thank you, living God, for the path that lies before us now and our futures in your hands. We thank you, living God. We pray this evening for the needs of the world and the life of the church, for the concerns of our own communities and those of our loved ones, Mem for members of our own communities and our families. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Living God, may your people not fail you. May your people in need not fail you, nor we fail them. O Christ, you are within each of us. It is not just the interior of the walls within which we are. It is our own inner being you have renewed. We are your temple, not made with hands. We are your body. If every wall should crumble and every church decay, we are your habitation. Nearer are you than breathing, closer than hands and feet. Ours are the eyes with which you, in the mystery, look out with compassion on the world. Yet, we bless you for your church, for your directing of us, your redeeming of us, and your indwelling. Take us outside, O Christ, outside holiness, out to where soldiers curse and nations clash at the crossroads of the world. So shall this building, our churches, continue to be justified. Our bodies, which make up the body of Christ, continue to be justified. We ask it for your own name's sake. Amen. May God, who is present in sunrise and nightfall, and in the crossing of the sea, guide your feet as you go. May God, who is with you when you sit and when you stand, encompass you with love and lead you by the hand. May God, who knows your path and the places where you rest, be with you in your waiting, be your good news for sharing, and lead you in the way that is everlasting. Amen. Good night.